When the PISA World Rankings were released last year, there was great angst in our country that we had apparently slipped from 7th to 13th in reading, from 7th to 18th in science, and 13th to 23rd in maths. Should we be worried? Well, I think New Zealand is a strong education system. It has one of the, some of the world's best performing schools. But at the same time, I think it is reason to look at the large disparities that are in the education system. And uh, I think it's important to look at where New Zealand stands internationally. So what do we have to understand from those results? And what do we have to learn from them? Well, the first lesson is that there are some very rapidly improving education system. You know, in a global economy, in a global society, improvement by national standards is not alone if the world around you moves faster, really. And uh, I think that's, something, that's why looking outwards, looking at yourself in the mirror of what other countries show is possible to achieve is a very important perspective, not the only one, but I do think it's important for New Zealand to keep looking into that mirror. Mm. Okay, well, Shanghai students came out on top. All right. um, that means what? That, that Shanghai authorities have the best education system in the world? Or that 15-year-olds um, in Shanghai are very good at doing PISA tests? Well, you know, PISA is a reflection on what happens in the classroom. It's not a simple test of whether students can reproduce subject matter content. It is actually looking at the capacity of students to think critically, to think creatively, and uh, students in Shanghai have got very good at that. They've not always been good at that. And uh, the capacity of the education system in Shanghai to attract the most talented teachers to the most challenging classrooms, to mobilize its human resources, is remarkable. I do think there are lessons to be learned from many other countries. It's not saying that it's the best education system by any standard, mm -hmm. But by one important metric, it comes out on top. It's a very authoritarian type of education system, isn't it? Well, that's what you might think when you think about China. But actually, the education system in Shanghai is entirely modeled around the profession. Mm. The, it's not a system with a lot of administrative control. Um, it's all, if you want to become famous in Shanghai as a teacher, mm. uh, you share your lessons on a platform where all other teachers share their lessons. And the more other teachers start using your lessons, the more important you become in the system, the more respect you obtain. It's really an education system built around prof a professional work organization, not an industrial work organization. I don't think that's author authoritarian. It's, it's something that is built from the bottom up on good practice. I was a teacher for 12 years before tomorrow's schools in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And we got brownie points for sharing. You know, and in fact, I think it's actually wired into the DNA of most teachers mm -hmm. that they want to cooperate, that they want to share. Mm -hmm. If they've got a good idea, they'll do that. But we also have, since 1987, we changed our education administration so that every school is autonomous. Now, I may be wrong in this, but I think we may be the only country in the world where every school is autonomous. Mm -hmm. And by talking with teachers and by talking with principals, I've kind of come to the view that this, they now are very competitive with each other. They're not cooperating in the well, way that they once did. And that the networks between schools have been destroyed and they're very um, informal networks now. Um, talk to me about what the data tells you about um, autonomous um, administration. Well, generally, the data show that uh, school autonomy is actually correlated with better system level performance. You have more discretion at the front line. But what's important is that that autonomy should not be in isolation. We can see, for example, when schools are autonomous but do not have a shared notion of what good practice is, you actually see that school autonomy works against you. When school autonomy means that the principal decides everything, the teachers are not involved in management, you can actually see school autonomy works against you. When you have a system of dis distributed leadership where teachers are part of the process, school autonomy is a great predictor for success. When there is transparency in the system, uh, you have actually school autonomy working in your favor. Mm -hmm. When schools work in isolation, and I do think we should not see uh, autonomy or automatically sort of connected to competition. Uh, it's the, the key really is professional autonomy mm -hmm. in a collaborative culture. And there are great examples for this around the world. But you see, it has become competitive. I mean, um, can I put it to you that publishing um, world rankings 
automatically generates competition. Well, you know, you look at the summit on the teaching profession that we have here, you have all these countries around the table and they share their ideas, their visions, their com com um, comparisons have created a platform for people to look at each other, to study what they do. I think they bring education systems out of isolation. The question is, how do we use those platforms? If we use them in a punitive way, you get sort of isolation, you get people working against each other. If you create shared opportunities, you can actually use comparisons in very effective ways to create a profession. And you know, in other disciplines, we are much better at this. If you look in uh, at medicine, for example, it's a highly competitive environment, but there's also a lot more collaboration professional collaboration. People feel associated with the profession even more than the institution they work for. I do wonder whether in fact one of our problems at the moment is we don't have a way of collaborating as well as we did in the past. Yeah, you know, and that's, that's exactly my point. The, gr the more responsibilities you devolve to the front line, the more you need to invest in capacity, mm -hmm. but also the stronger your system around mm -hmm. the schools needs to be to ensure that resources are fairly um, allocated, that you attract the most talented teachers into the most challenging classrooms, um, that you ensure that good practice, knowledge in education is very sticky. It rests where it is. To get it out of the classroom, into the system, is something that requires very, very strong education systems. Let's talk about that, good teachers in, in challenging classrooms. As you know, we've got a decile one to 10 mm -hmm. system. Um, the decile one schools uh, with the socially disadvantaged mm -hmm. kids, the poor kids, the ten, the, the ten is, is, are the wealthier kids. We do distribute money more to the lower end of the, of the scale, but you know, it isn't working. Uh, what I heard you say, and what I think I've heard you say, is that uh, in other countries where the system is working better, you've got a mix of, of socio-economic groups in the same school. Is that better than having the decile system? Well, I think uh, uh, socio-economic mix is always an advantage. The more social segregation you have in the school system, the greater your equity-related challenges. Mm -hmm. But you can still do a lot to moderate inequalities. Mm -hmm. You know, the instrument that New Zealand currently has is m distributing money by deciles is pretty blunt. Uh, and you know, if I give you more money as a, and a better salary, and it's still not possible for you as a teacher to do good professional work, which is the aspiration of every teacher, you know, more money isn't necessarily the sole answer. Uh, it is about a combination of resources and capacity and support. And again, this is something where you can put a lot more in, uh, emphasis in the profession. See, yeah. I've, I've heard this idea that you, you get really good teachers and you put them into uh, challenging schools. Mm -hmm. How do you decide what is a really good teacher? Because that's really difficult. When you're actually trying to come down to some sort of quantitative measure of what makes a really good teacher, it's so much of the environment the teacher's in depends on the results, you know. Yeah. Well, I think whenever you seek a mechanical solution to this, you're going to get into trouble. And the key is to have multiple measures of success. They can include the results of students. They can include professional judgment. And to look at the quality of teaching through multiple eyes and multiple perspectives. And that's what high-performing education systems do. You go to Singapore, 15 indicators of success. It's not just test scores. It's not just principal judgment. But all of those things together create an image of what great teaching practices is. And I'm not even saying teachers. It's about great teaching. And then you need to make it attractive. Uh, and that has to do more than with money, with really good mm. career structures. When Finland was on top, mm. they suddenly had a lot of educational tourists going to Finland straight away to find out what was happening here. I imagine Shanghai is going through the same thing at the moment. Um, why, why is that happening, that we go, OK, well, they're number one on the PISA test, therefore we've got to go and find out what, what they're doing? Because it seems to me that to judge an education system on three subjects is a very limited view of what an education is about. What is the purpose of an education? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, you need to build the, the, the concept of competency and the con uh, concept of education around a much wider framework. What PISA gives you is a spotlight on different areas. They're still very important. We have very good evidence that those kind of skills that are being measured are very predictive for the future success of children, but they're a limited aspect. And when people go to Finland, they don't look at the PISA scores, they look at what is behind that education system that is highly equitable. 
that has been very good at minimizing disparities among schools. When they go to Shanghai, they look at Shanghai's rapid growth in education. I do think we, lose, we do that much too little. We should look a lot more outside, out of immediate neighborhood. We should have teachers looking a lot more to other teachers, schools looking out towards other schools, education systems learning from and with each other. I think there's a lot more we can actually achieve with this. Do you measure for creativity at all? Actually, on the 1st of April, we're going to uh, release our first assessment of creative problem solving skills. Right. It is only a limited aspect of creativity. Uh, uh, again, you know, it's only one aspect that we can measure. We haven't yet developed assessments of arts and music. But the PISA framework is actually going, becoming more and more comprehensive. Mm -hmm. In 2015, we're going to release our first assessment of interpersonal skills, collaborative skills. Yes. Yeah. Also very, very important, harder to measure. Some would say even more important than some of these other topics because, in fact, uh, you know, people are talking about us being at the doorway to the creative economy. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I do wonder whether we know about the long-term effects of things like the Chinese education system. I came across this last night when I was reading it, and uh, it's, it says that uh, looking at um, uh, patents in mm -hmm. the US, China registered 1,600 patents mm -hmm. uh, last, in 2009. Japan, by contrast, registered more than 35,000. Mm -hmm. 35,000. Germany, 9,000. Spain, mm -hmm. 6,500. How's, you know, one wonders whether, in fact, um, a focused uh, bread and butter type of education is actually delivering the kind of um, minds that will be needed for mm -hmm. tomorrow's economy. Yeah, you know, but no country is more aware of this than China. Mm -hmm. And we, Japan went through a very similar trajectory, you know, in the 1970s and 80s. Mm -hmm. People criticized Japan for the very same thing, a system that was only geared towards road learning. Mm -hmm. Today you can see there, which is the, one of the countries with the most innovative economy. Mm -hmm. And again, that tells us that, you know, education systems are not standing still. And I wouldn't mm -hmm. underrate, underestimate what is happening in countries like mm -hmm. China or mm -hmm. Singapore in terms of fostering creative skills. And we also need to think there are two parts of the equation. One is the talent you develop. And the other is how good is your society to actually use that talent, mm. not to convert better skills into better jobs and better lives of mm. people. Mm. That's something, the US economy is a great example, actually. The talent pool is really limited, mm. or very patchy at least, but mm. the economy is very, very good in absorbing skills and mm. converting them into great jobs and, uh, and great lives. And that's something where Asia certainly has to learn a lot. But they work on those equations, they work on multiple dimensions. And we shouldn't stigmatize education systems often for what were the limits in the past. I'm going to go back a bit because I, d I do think one of our problems is that we aren't joining the dots between schools well enough. We don't, in the old system, it, was, it became moribund because it was kind of too centralized. But now it seems to me that it's too free and people aren't sharing and, and doing yeah. all those sorts of things in the way that they once did. Um, and I, 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 I absolutely agree with this. I think that is the challenge for a country like New Zealand. And I've seen that for myself. I've been in some of the most impressive schools I've ever seen in any place, including some of the Maori medium instruction schools. But you go to other schools and you can see, you know, the communities they rely on, you know, who's going to elect the school principal, who's going to provide the capacity in a school that has so many responsibilities. That is the challenge. And that's where public policy should or needs to come in. So school autonomy is a great strength of the system in New Zealand. But you need to build around this a very strong system that mobilizes resources and, and builds that capacity. Well, see, one of the things also that occurs to me is that, and as I look at this, um, like the NCA mm -hmm. system and the publishing results of schools mm -hmm. and things, I wonder how much good that does because it's like it's competitive rather than collaborative. I mean, we know that there are difficulties in, in decile one schools mm. and getting kids through. That doesn't, this, it seems to me sometimes that tests are used more like weapons mm. than they are as tools. Mm -hmm. And I, when I was a teacher, we always looked at the tests as a tool. Mm. How can I benefit this child from that yeah. piece of, you know, do you, when you look at what media do with with your work, when you look at what politicians do with your work, do you sometimes wince? What is the purpose of what you're doing? 
Well, you know, if I look at the improvement that PISA has stimulated in so many countries, my own country is a great example. In 2000, the big PISA shock, but then lots of things have happened. At every level of the system, parents got involved, teachers got involved, politicians did something. And I think that's sort of the idea of it. It should stimulate our thinking. And, uh, but it, I, I agree, I think a punitive use of tests in any form of assessment mm -hmm. is not going to be constructive. Mm -hmm. We also need to walk towards more multi-layered assessment systems, you know. We need to tell people the truth. Mm -hmm. I think that is really, really important. And, but that means giving students feedback on how they can be better learners, mm -hmm. teachers feedback on how they become better teachers, mm -hmm. school systems feedback on how they come, become more effective. And if you do not do that and you just tell people, you know, how good they are or not, then you end up with those kinds of frustrations and and the media often use results very selectively, as do politicians, clear. Well, I think one of the unfortunate things that happened um, as a result of the announcement of the last test was that there was a, a sort of a, a spate of teacher bashing, or almost be bad teaching, you know, and, and no kind of appreciation that a lot mm. of what happens in a school depends on what happens outside the school gate. Sure. And, you know, it's about... Um, whether you come from an environment in which learning is and aspirations and mm. all of those things, the kind of things that you know so well. Um, what's your view on that? It's true. The context of a school and of, of the learning environment is very, very important. But again, I find international comparisons fascinating in this respect because they show us that in similar situations, success is so different. You know, you look again, you look to Shanghai and you can see that the least advantaged students in Shanghai outperform the most privileged kids in many other countries. And that shows us that actually, yeah, social background is a huge challenge, but there's a lot that we can do about it. And that should not rest on the shoulders of teachers alone. That should be the responsibility of the entire education system. Which countries best prepare their children for the uncertain future that, we, that we're all facing? We have no idea really what the future will hold for us. Who's doing, you think, the best? Well, you know, the big differentiator is actually how countries make trade-off between the present and the future. Now, you know, if you look at Europe, you know, we have spent the money of our children for consumption today. If you look to Asia, everybody's investing resources into the future of the children. They scrape the last resources. They will never spare money to, to uh, develop a, a strong education for everyone, uh, independent of social background. And I think that is a very, very promising kind of you, you can make no better investment. You know, I think we're a bit like that. I think we are spending today and actually not thinking about the future yeah. and not sp investing in the future too much. And we also have this view that your education is, so, is yours and yeah. you should pay for it now. Yeah. Whereas in the New Zealand I grew up, there was an understanding that everybody benefited yeah. if everyone was educated. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. I mean, you know, when you look at uh, income inequality, this is very closely related to the inequality in skills. The way you distribute the skills in your population shapes the way in which the wealth, wealth in nations is actually shared. You can deal with income inequality through taxes. You can take money from the rich, give it to the poor, and so on. But that's not going to address the, the, the source of those inequalities. And that's why it's so critically important to make sure that every child can realize it, his potential. You must be aware of the criticism, obviously, that, you know, to, how come Shanghai, why not China, you know? Um, you know, we could pick a really good, um, expensive area of New Zealand <laughs> and our scores might be higher too. What's your view about that? What, what is your answer to that, that, you know, that, that you, you picked a small area of China? Yeah, surely Shanghai isn't representative of China. It's just the only area where we were able so far to develop technically sound and robust data. We're actually now working with a wider range of provinces and soon we're going to have a more or less complete picture of China. It's a transitional measure, uh, but you know, keep in mind we're talking about more than 25 million people, so it's not a very small system by comparison. Though. And it's a very diverse country as well. You know, it's very rich areas and very, very poor areas. I think I read somewhere in the report about Chinese students taking on responsibility for their mistakes, for their learning, and not blaming teachers mm -hmm. or blaming the school or whatever. Mm -hmm. That was a self-image. That, mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's correct, is it? Yeah, it goes further than that. We ask, ask students questions like, you know, what do you believe makes you successful in mathematics? Mm -hmm. And you have students in New Zealand, a lot of students who tell us, well, you know, it's about talent. If I'm not born as a genius in mathematics, then I study something else. Mm -hmm. 
And if you ask the Chinese the same question, they say, you know, if I really try hard, mm -hmm. I trust my teachers are going to help me to success, mm -hmm. succeed, and I'm going to be successful. And that actually becomes true. And that tells me a lot about the education system. Mm -hmm. In one education system, students see the school as sorting people. You know, whatever you go in here, you come out in a certain way. In the other part, they see themselves as owners of the success in learning. And they trust the system to actually support and challenge them. There is no tolerance for failure in the, in the Chinese system. And that is something we can again learn from. But there's thousands of years of that kind of idea, yeah. isn't it, in China? Yeah. I mean, it goes back to the Confucius yeah. examinations yeah. and things like that. So they have a different view of the teacher, I think, yeah. and the role of the teacher yeah. in society. So maybe they wouldn't question the teacher. But I also noticed later in the report that um, girls and failing tended to um, uh, also um, blame themselves rather than the teacher. So what does this tell us? The success and failure of kids are still, you know, blaming themselves rather than teachers. What does it tell us? I mean, Well, if, if, if children get the message, whether it's from the school or from the environment, that they are not the owners of their success, then actually their, their actual performance is likely to be a lot lower, and that's what the data tell us. And uh, it tells me it's sort of that we need to do better in giving students the sense that you know if they if they invest the effort, we as the education system are going to give them every chance to become successful. I, I absolutely, as a former teacher, I totally agree with the idea that what you have to get is get the child to take ownership of yeah. learning. But it seems not to me you're like having a double look at the spoon here because you're saying look, success is based on on um, you know self absorption, yeah. but also failure is. <laughs> yeah. And I don't think it helps us very much. I mean, I think it's an intuitive suggestion rather than empirical, but maybe you've, you're a statistician. You yeah, no, me. actually, we have good measures of self-efficacy of students, which is what we're talking about, and we have good measures of performance. And we can see how strongly they are related at the individual level, but interestingly also at the aggregate level. There are systems it's not just individual students who differ, but there are systems where students feel a lot more ownership for their own success and for their own learning process. They believe in hard work and effort rather than they believe in talent. And these are important predictors. So tell me, what is the purpose of an education in the 21st century? How are we going to set up our kids for the future? What's, what is, give me a nutshell. To help people to be successful in a life, and in life that is very difficult to, to predict, you know, to get a job that hasn't been created, to solve problems that we can't imagine today, to use technologies that haven't been invented. I think that's really what education is about, to solve social problems that we have no imagination of today. And, and this is, I think, the challenge. The kind of routine cognitive skills, the, the kind of things that are easy to teach and easy to test, are also easy to digitize, automate, outsource. No, that's not going to help children to be successful. It has to do with interpersonal skills, the great collaborators. Innovation today is no longer about you, know, you having a great idea and doing it. It's about you, you being able to connect the dots, to think across disciplinary boundaries, to work through and with multiple cultures, multiple lenses, multiple paradigms. That's really what good education should be about. In mathematics, for example, it's not about teaching children mathematical routines, formulas, equations, and theorems. It's helping them understand that mathematics is a language with which they can understand, structure, predict the world, like history. Not treating, looking at this kind of metacognitive capabilities, they're going to be the key because the content, you know, you can look up at Google. In a world, it may, what you know doesn't make you successful. Google knows everything. It's about what you can do with what you know. And also about choosing what's good information and, Absolutely. and what's not good information on Wikipedia or anything else. Absolutely. You know, In the past, you know, literacy was about extracting information from pre-coded text. Mm -hmm. When you didn't have the answer, you went to an encyclopedia, you picked the answer and you could trust the answer to be true. Today you go on Google and you find 20,000 answers and you have to navigate through information, construct your own information. Literacy is a totally different world today and in 20 years from now we made, and that's I think the challenge of education to do, to create and, and to develop capacities for a world that we cannot anticipate. I 
very pleased to hear you're going to develop some other tests in this direction yeah. because that was one of the things mm. when I read through this huge report that I'm going, hang on, there's yeah. all of these things. Like what we're doing now, mm. oral language. Mm. You know, if you're good at oral language, if you can persuade people, mm. if you can debate with them, mm. you can sell things to them. Mm. Um, you know, the, the, if you think about the wide variety of mm. people in the world who make their living from talking. Mm. Yeah. Um, but, but I give you an example. If you look actually the PISA 2000 test, in the year 2000, it's hard to imagine now, but digital reading wasn't very important. No. So we actually, in the 2000 test, it was about reading books, reading novels, reading tables, and so on. In the year 2009, digital reading was at the center of this. It was about the capacity of students to construct a mental image of information they didn't see in front of them, because that's what the web today is about. Can you actually not lose yourself in a, in a wealth of information, but navigate through this? So actually, the PISA test has evolved step by step. I, I heard and, somebody and talking the other day about how young people don't actually lead, read long-form books anymore. What they do is they spool down, they get yeah. the bit that they want, and then they, it's yeah. like McDonald's. You, know, yeah. you come in here and you, yeah. and you go out there. Yeah. Um, are you finding that, that there's difference in the reading style now? I mean, you do see that um, mathematical skills have improved, but reading skills have declined in many countries. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's not the technical reading skills I'm concerned about, but when we see declines in the capacity of individuals to, to analyze information, to judge information, to evaluate, to critically review material, mm -hmm. that's the point we need to worry. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. It was a great set of questions. Yeah.